a quiet night, a secluded overlook, and a young couple simply looking for a moment's peace. But what started as an innocent evening would soon turn into a nightmare that would haunt a small town for decades. Gregory Nickel, a young army veteran, had just returned to his hometown of Vernal, Utah, a close-knit community surrounded by endless stretches of rugged desert. He was known for his kindness, his loyalty, and the respect he commanded among those who knew him. On a crisp November evening in 1972, Gregory drove to a local scenic overlook, his companion by his side, unaware that a dark presence was lurking in the shadows. Imagine the fear that set in when an unknown man approached Gregory's car, claiming he needed help. Was he a passerby in genuine distress, or was there something more sinister behind his request? Gregory, with his instinct to help others, stepped out, a decision that would change his life forever. What really happened in those final moments? And who were the men responsible for the brutal events of that night? For nearly 50 years, the mystery surrounding Gregory's tragic death and his companion's harrowing ordeal remained unresolved. But with time, technology, and an unyielding pursuit of justice, answers began to emerge, shedding light on a case that had long haunted both family and community. As we unravel this tale of loyalty, violence, and relentless pursuit of the truth, the question remains, could Gregory's story have ended differently, or was he destined to become a haunting memory for an entire town? But before we dive deeper into the mystery, I'd like to ask for a small favor. The statistics show that more than 70% of you watching aren't subscribed to the channel yet. If you're enjoying these deep dives into true crime and want to stay updated on future cases, please consider subscribing. It really helps the channel grow and ensures you don't miss out on any new videos. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the case. Gregory Dahl Nickel was born in the early 1950s, a time when small town values, community bonds, and the echoes of post-World War II optimism shaped daily life in the United States. Growing up in Vernal, Utah, a modest town nestled in the Winter Basin, Gregory was surrounded by sweeping landscapes and a tight-knit community. Vernal was known for its rugged beauty, rich with history, and was home to just a few thousand residents at the time, a place where neighbors knew one another, and everyone shared a common bond through both the land and its traditions. From an early age, Gregory was described as a kind-hearted, easygoing individual. Friends and family would often recount his infectious smile and approachable demeanor, characteristics that made him popular among his peers. Living in a small town like Vernal, Gregory was exposed to a lifestyle that encouraged hard work, honesty, and a deep respect for nature. This was a place where boys grew up learning to fish, hunt, and navigate the often harsh terrain that defined the Winter Basin. By the time he was in high school, Gregory had already started taking on small jobs to help support his family and gain a sense of independence. Graduating from high school marked a significant turning point in Gregory's life. Like many young men of his generation, he felt the pull of duty and patriotism. He entered military service shortly after graduation, leaving behind the familiar comforts of Vernal for the discipline and rigor of army life. Serving in the army provided Gregory with experiences that broadened his worldview and gave him a sense of purpose. He trained alongside men from all over the country, learned skills that extended beyond the small town life he had known, and developed a disciplined mindset that he carried with him off duty as well. As he settled back into life in Vernal, Gregory's social circle remained close-knit, though he frequently made new acquaintances. Despite the changes he had undergone, he remained loyal to his old friends and spent a great deal of time outdoors exploring the rugged terrain that surrounded the Uinta Basin. His weekends were often spent on adventures, drives along scenic routes, and, occasionally,
quiet nights parked at scenic overlooks to enjoy the serenity of the landscape. However, the unassuming life Gregory tried to build for himself would soon take a tragic turn. What started as a quiet night out on November 26, 1972, would become the night that forever altered the town's history and would leave a mystery that haunted his family and the community for decades. The evening of November 26, 1972, was like any other cool autumn night in Vernal, Utah. The air was crisp and the stars stretched across the sky, illuminating the quiet desert landscape. It was a Sunday, and as dusk settled in, the town slowly quieted, with most people retiring for the night or unwinding with loved ones. This night, however, would prove unforgettable, casting a shadow over Vernal that would linger for decades. Gregory Nickel, then 21 years old, had planned to spend the evening with an 18-year-old woman he was seeing at the time. Together, they drove to a local scenic overlook just west of Vernal, a spot known for its expansive views of the desert and its quiet, secluded atmosphere. It was the kind of place young couples often went for some peace away from the watchful eyes of a small-town community. The Overlook was a well-loved location for locals, providing a beautiful backdrop where they could enjoy each other's company under the open sky. It was shortly after they had parked that an unknown man approached the vehicle. In the darkness, the figure was difficult to make out, but he quickly revealed his presence with an urgent tone, claiming there had been an accident nearby. He spoke in a way that was both commanding and concerning, catching Gregory's attention immediately. The man asked for help, saying he needed assistance and subtly urging Gregory to step out of the car. It seemed like a simple request, one that Gregory, with his inherent kindness and willingness to help, couldn't ignore. This situation, being asked for help in the middle of a quiet night, was unusual but not unheard of. In a place like Vernal, people were accustomed to helping their neighbors, even strangers. Gregory's instincts, shaped by his upbringing and his time in the army, drove him to help without hesitation, an act of trust and goodwill that would tragically turn into a fatal decision. Gregory opened the car door and stepped out, intending to offer his assistance. In that instant, the atmosphere shifted from one of quiet calm to a harrowing turn of events. The man, who had appeared to need help, suddenly produced a 22 caliber pistol and fired multiple shots at Gregory. It happened quickly. Before Gregory could process the change, he was hit. His instincts kicked in, and he attempted to shield his companion, using his body as a barrier to protect her from the gunfire. Despite his injuries, Gregory's first thought was of her safety, a testament to his selflessness and courage, even in the face of unimaginable terror. The scene was one of chaos and confusion. Gregory's companion was in shock, struggling to comprehend what had just happened. She was left frozen as the assailant forced her out of the car and into the driver's seat. The man, now in control, commanded her to drive away from the overlook, leaving Gregory injured and alone at the scene. She could only comply, her fear overriding any thought of resistance as they drove into the dark, desolate terrain. As she drove, they ventured further away from the overlook, deeper into the remote Utah desert. It was here, in a location not far from what is now known as Bro Reservoir, that they encountered a second man. The second man's presence suggested that the attack on Gregory and his companion was not an impulsive act but a premeditated assault, orchestrated with deliberate and sinister intent. The night's terror was far from over, and as she would soon learn, the two men had plans far darker than she could have imagined. The two men proceeded with a level of cruelty that reflected a cold-blooded intent. They first turned their attention to Gregory's car, with his body still inside, and set it ablaze. In the dark, isolated landscape, the fire would have burned brightly against the night sky, a stark and brutal attempt to erase any evidence of the crime and to prevent Gregory from receiving help. This horrific act seemed to symbolize their complete disregard for the lives they had impacted that night. 
The flames devoured the car, filling the air with acrid smoke, while the men's focus shifted to Gregory's companion. In the hours that followed, the young woman endured unspeakable trauma. The two men subjected her to a prolonged and brutal assault, further underscoring their malicious intentions. The remote location offered her no chance to flee, no one to hear her cries for help. Every moment must have felt like an eternity as she struggled to comprehend and survive the horror inflicted upon her. After hours of torment, when the men had satisfied their cruel intentions, they made a surprising and chilling decision. They opted to release her rather than kill her, which was unusual given their earlier ruthlessness. However, they were far from merciful in their decision. Instead of taking her back to Vernal, they left her in a rural area near Duchenne City, approximately 60 miles away from where they had first abducted her. In the cold, pre-dawn hours, she was left alone, traumatized, and stranded in the middle of an unfamiliar landscape. Despite her overwhelming fear and physical pain, Gregory's companion somehow managed to summon the strength to seek help. She stumbled through the rough terrain, finding her way to a nearby farmhouse, where she was able to contact authorities. The severity of her ordeal was immediately evident, and she was taken to a local hospital where forensic evidence was collected, a process that, in time, would prove crucial in the investigation. She provided the police with as many details as she could recall, though the trauma and the coverings over her head had made it difficult to see her attackers clearly. As the sun rose over Vernal on November 27, 1972, the community awoke to the devastating news of Gregory Nichols' murder. The discovery of his charred vehicle, burned beyond recognition in the desolate landscape, sent shockwaves through the town. Gregory's friends, family, and neighbors, many of whom had known him since childhood, were left reeling, struggling to grasp the horrifying events that had unfolded in their otherwise peaceful community. Law enforcement responded swiftly. The Uinta County Sheriff's Office, along with local authorities, immediately launched an extensive investigation. The scene where Gregory's vehicle had been set ablaze offered grim evidence of the violence that had occurred there. The burnt remains of the car were meticulously examined for clues, though the fire had destroyed much of the physical evidence. Gregory's body, found inside the car, bore evidence of multiple gunshot wounds, confirming that he had been murdered in cold blood. The investigation extended beyond the overlook. Law enforcement officials spent days combing through the vast, rugged desert landscape for any signs that might lead them to the attackers. They searched on foot and by air, covering miles of barren terrain, hoping to find evidence that might provide a lead. This was no easy task. The Utah desert, with its open spaces and harsh environment, offered countless places for evidence to be hidden or destroyed. The authorities took great care in collecting and preserving every piece of evidence they could find. Over 30 items were submitted to the FBI crime lab, including clothing, fibers, and any remaining fragments from the crime scenes. This level of meticulous evidence collection underscored the gravity of the case, as law enforcement understood the rarity and severity of a crime like this in a small community like Vernal. Yet, despite their exhaustive efforts, the initial investigation was hampered by a lack of clear leads. The woman who had survived the assault became a critical witness in the investigation. She bravely recounted the terrifying events of that night to the best of her ability, providing details about her assailants' behavior, their voices, and any distinguishing characteristics she could remember. However, due to the head coverings they had placed on her, her ability to describe them physically was limited, making it difficult for investigators to generate any solid profiles of the suspects. Still, her account provided crucial insights into the events, and law enforcement worked tirelessly to piece together the night from her fragmented memories. In the following days, the community came together to mourn Gregory's death. The pain of his loss rippled through Vernal, where memories of his kindness and the respect he had garnered were shared openly. 
For many, the horror of his murder felt personal, a violation of the safety and security they had always taken for granted. The community's sorrow was compounded by an undercurrent of fear, as many residents began questioning their own safety in light of what had happened to Gregory and his companion. As weeks turned into months, leads dwindled, and the investigation began to stall. Rumors circulated, speculations about strangers passing through town or individuals with hidden dark sides. Despite their best efforts, law enforcement could not uncover any substantial evidence that could lead them to the attackers. The case seemed to be slipping away, the mystery growing colder with each passing day. The files were kept open, but Gregory's murder and his companion's ordeal started to fade from active investigation into the realm of unresolved tragedies. With little to go on and no major breakthroughs, the case was officially declared a cold case. Yet, it was never truly forgotten. Law enforcement officers who had been involved in the investigation remained hopeful that one day, a piece of evidence or a new technology might finally bring Gregory's killers to justice. The case remained unsolved for nearly five decades, hanging over the Uinta Basin community like a dark cloud. Family members, friends, and investigators carried the weight of his loss with them, holding on to a fragile hope that someday, answers might surface. It wasn't until 2020, nearly 50 years after the horrific events of that night, that technology and persistence combined to breathe new life into the investigation. The Sheriff's Department and forensic teams, spurred by advances in DNA analysis, decided to revisit the evidence from the night of Gregory's murder. By this time, forensic science had evolved in ways investigators from the 1970s could never have imagined. DNA profiling, once an unreliable and limited technology, had become a powerful tool capable of identifying suspects with remarkable accuracy. For cold case detectives, DNA testing had become a crucial method to re-examine evidence that had once seemed inconclusive. The Uinta County Sheriff's Office, undeterred by the years that had passed, took a bold step. They resubmitted forensic evidence collected from Gregory's companion back in 1972 to the Utah State Crime Lab in the hope that new testing might yield the clues they had long sought. The DNA samples, which had been meticulously preserved, were re-examined using advanced methods capable of extracting genetic material from even trace amounts of evidence. By January 2020, investigators received a breakthrough that reignited hope in the case. Forensic analysts had managed to identify two distinct male DNA profiles from the evidence collected in 1972. For the first time, the attacker's genetic markers were isolated, offering a tangible lead in a case that had gone without one for decades. In September 2020, forensic analysts made a match to one of the DNA profiles, linking it to a man named Daniel Arthur Bell. Bell had lived in the Winter Basin at the time of Gregory's murder, making him familiar with the area and its secluded backroads. Records revealed a disturbing history. Bell had a criminal record that included a rape conviction in 1988, showing a past of violent, predatory behavior. He had later moved to Washington State, where he continued to live a relatively unremarkable life until his death in 2019. His remains had been cremated, effectively erasing any possibility of further physical analysis. However, the evidence was there a DNA match tying Bell to the night of Gregory's murder. Although Bell had passed away, making direct justice impossible, the identification of one of Gregory's attackers was a momentous development. The second DNA profile had yet to be matched. Investigators were determined to continue, knowing that another individual had played a role in the crime. Forensic genealogy the same technique that had helped identify the Golden State Killer in 2018, was employed to trace potential family connections related to the second DNA profile. This technique allowed forensic analysts to cross-reference the unknown DNA with publicly available genetic data from individuals who had voluntarily submitted their DNA for genealogical purposes. 
Eventually, they identified a man named Daryl Eugene Choate, a 74-year-old resident of Toole, Utah. Choate had a history of criminal behavior, including multiple offenses involving sexual assault. Given his criminal record and his presence in Utah at the time of Gregory's murder, Choate fit the profile of the second assailant, and his DNA was the final piece needed to confirm the match. To obtain his DNA without alerting him, investigators used a covert approach, collecting his genetic material from discarded items. This surreptitious sample was carefully analyzed and cross-referenced with the unknown DNA profile from the 1972 evidence. The results were undeniable. Choate's DNA matched the second profile, linking him to the crime and identifying him as the second perpetrator in the horrific events of that night. The revelations about Bell and Choate represented a significant victory for cold case detectives and forensic scientists alike. For years, Gregory's murder had remained a mystery, a cold case that haunted Vernal and beyond. Now, at last, the veil of mystery was lifted, and the men responsible for that night had been named. Daryl Eugene Choate, still alive, now faced charges that would bring him to account for his role in the brutal crime. With the DNA match confirmed, law enforcement took swift action. On November 1, 2024, nearly 52 years after Gregory Nichols' life was cut short, Daryl Eugene Choate was officially charged with first-degree felony murder in connection to Gregory's death. For the family and community, this development was both surreal and long overdue, a long-awaited opportunity for justice to finally be served. The case against Choate was fortified by the strength of the DNA evidence, which tied him directly to the events of that tragic night. But beyond the physical evidence, Choate's criminal history cast a disturbing light on his past behaviors. Investigators unearthed records that painted a picture of a man with a troubling pattern of violent and predatory behavior spanning decades. His criminal record was marked by a series of sexual assault charges and other offenses, hinting at a dark and violent past that had likely remained unchecked for years. This background made him an ideal suspect, but it was the DNA that definitively placed him at the scene of the crime, finally linking him to Gregory's murder and the assault on Gregory's companion. The legal proceedings commenced with an arrest warrant issued for Choate. As the case moved forward, Prosecutors began preparing the evidence against Choate. The prosecution's case was primarily built on the DNA evidence and the testimony of Gregory's companion, who had survived the night and could still recount the horrifying details of her ordeal. While years had passed, her memories remained vivid, and she was ready to stand as a witness, despite the pain of reliving that traumatic night. Her courage and willingness to testify became a cornerstone of the case, lending a human voice to the tragedy that had once only existed in cold case files. Choate's legal team prepared for a challenging defense, likely aware of the overwhelming weight of DNA evidence against him. Given the advancements in forensic science, attempting to discredit the DNA findings would be a monumental task. Prosecutors, on the other hand, were confident in the integrity of the evidence knowing that the genetic match was irrefutable and that forensic experts could testify to the reliability of these findings. The prosecution opened with a compelling narrative, meticulously laying out the events of November 26, 1972, based on forensic evidence, DNA analysis, and witness testimony. Prosecutors aimed to establish the horror and brutality of the crime, emphasizing that Choate and his accomplice had committed their acts with premeditation and malice. Their argument centered on the DNA evidence, which had been rigorously analyzed and directly linked Choate to the crime scene and the assault on Gregory's companion. The prosecutors called forensic experts to the stand who testified about the reliability of DNA evidence, explaining to the jury how advanced techniques had allowed for a precise match to Choate even after decades. The defense, recognizing the strength of the DNA evidence, attempted to pivot by suggesting alternative explanations 
or raising questions about procedural errors. They implied that the investigation, because of its long duration and cold case status, might have introduced inconsistencies. Yet prosecutors consistently rebutted these claims, reinforcing that the DNA match was irrefutable and that procedural integrity had been maintained throughout the investigation. As the trial progressed, the prosecution methodically built a case that presented Choate as a calculating, violent individual with a pattern of criminal behavior that aligned with the brutality of the 1972 assault. They referenced his criminal history, which included previous offenses of a similar nature, arguing that the assault on Gregory and his companion was not an isolated event, but rather a premeditated act by a man with a history of violence. The trial concluded, and the jury retired to deliberate. Their decision was awaited with bated breath, as Gregory's family and the public hoped for a verdict that would finally bring closure to the decades-long ordeal. After hours of deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict. Daryl Eugene Choate was found guilty of first-degree murder, as well as other charges related to the assault on Gregory's companion. He was sentenced and would spend the remainder of his life in prison. For Gregory's family, the years without answers had been filled with heartache and unanswered questions. They had celebrated birthdays, anniversaries, and milestones without him, feeling his absence acutely at each gathering. They had carried the weight of his memory in their hearts, hoping that one day the truth would come to light. His sister, Lynette Ray, had particularly kept the flame of justice alive, driven by a fierce determination to honor her brother's memory. Her commitment to seeking answers, alongside the patience and strength she demonstrated through years of uncertainty, underscored the power of family love and dedication. What do you think about advancements in DNA technology being used to solve cases like this? Do you believe every cold case deserves the same attention and resources, no matter how many years have passed? And how would you feel if it were someone you loved, knowing that justice might take decades but could still eventually come? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. If you found this story compelling, remember to like, share, and subscribe for more true crime stories like this. Tap the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. And if you're curious about more unsolved mysteries and the breakthroughs that bring closure to families, Check out the other videos popping up on the screen now. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.